And as, you enter, as that particle enters the surface ocean, the first thing that happens is all of this inorganic iron on the surface starts to kind of fractionate off of the surface into the water. And so you get this inorganic iron input right at the surface, but it's not soluble. So in the absence of organic ligands, these colloids will clump back together, form new particles, and they'll sink out of the ocean, which does no favors to the phytoplankton who can only really live where the light is, right, at the upper, in the upper part of the water column. What my PhD student has shown is that the presence of organic ligands, and we use model ligands based on laboratory and culture work, um, actually pull some of that iron from these inorganic colloids into a soluble organic complex, allowing that iron to stick in the surface waters. And so this organic complexation is critical to, tra to converting iron coming from the particulate iron sources into a soluble phase that biology can then access. In the absence of organic ligands, we lose we believe we lose most of that iron um, to precipitation and flocculation. Now, for copper, on the other hand, organic ligands typically decrease bioavailability. And this is because we still think of copper largely from this, um, this concept of the free ion model, only that copper 2 plus is bioavailable. So as you add um, organic ligands, you drive the formation of copper L, and you lose some of copper prime, which includes free copper, and that reduces your bioavailable free copper. This is really important in high copper environments, so coastal waters, um, urban estuaries, things like that. And this is because um, phytoplankton can actually produce ligands to sequester that copper. So this is from uh, Jim Moffat's work back in the early 90s, showing that as you increase the copper concentration in a media of a cyanobacteria, you get this production of organic ligands um, associated with that increasing copper. And as you add these ligands to the system, you actually convert this copper prime to copper L, and it reduces your free copper and brings the bugs back to this you know, happy, just right porridge situation. I want to point out that this is kind of, this is the model of how we think about copper, and, and my lab does a lot of work looking at um, copper toxicity in inshore waters and, and evaluating the role of ligands. But one of the th really interesting things that's coming out of our open ocean work is that organically complex copper in the open ocean can actually be an important biological source of copper when, when the bugs need it. So this gets back to the fact that organic complexes are still bioavailable for copper. It's just there isn't as much demand for that copper in the open ocean as there is for, say, iron. So, the research questions in my lab. What is the distribution of organic metal binding ligands in the oceans? We are still learning this. So I'll show you some of the first data that we, uh, the first basin-wide data that we've done with this um, as part of the geotraces program. What are the sources, sinks, and cycling processes of these ligands? So, so how do these ligands cycle themselves? Because it turns out that these ligands are incredibly important. The, the cycling of ligands themselves is incredibly important, not just the influence that they have on metals. And then how do these ligands and their cycles influence the biogeochemical cycles of metals? This is kind of our, our baseline question. All right, so um, part of the funding in my lab comes from the Geotraces program. The Geotraces program is a global ocean survey of trace elements and isotopes. It's the first attempt that we're making at characterizing, for example, dissolved iron concentrations across the ocean basins. You might wonder why we've waited so long to do this. Um, it is not because we didn't think it was important. We have long known that iron was an incredibly important element in the oceans, but this gets back to the rusty ships and the copper-based anti-fouling paint. It's really difficult to sample the water column for iron and not just sample the fact that your ship showed up there that day. So we need really specialized equipment, and that largely involves a lot of things like Kevlar and Teflon, which are relatively um, recent additions to our sampling tool set. The Geotraces program, um, 30 countries are involved in this. We started this in 2010. It will take 10 years for us to accomplish our baseline survey data, which will follow these maps. The yellow lines are the ones we have completed so far. Um, the black lines we've completed as part of the International Polar Year cruises. And the red lines are the ones that are planned and coming up soon. Um, we will also be conducting, as a, a program, process-based studies. Every country is approaching this differently. In the U.S., we anticipate starting the process studies towards the end of that 10-year bracket. Um, and then this covers basically every element in the periodic table, give or take um, the relevant isotopes and the compounds that are used as tracers. For the U.S. program, the U.S. has covered three of these legs, the Arctic leg up here, the North Atlantic zonal transect I've outlined in white, and the East Pacific zonal transect I've also outlined in white. These two in white are the ones that um, I did the iron speciation for and measured the iron binding ligands. And this is the results for these. So the North Atlantic is here on the left, and this is going, and it's kind of hard to see, but the North-South leg is this right panel. The east-west cross basin is the blue panel. 
Um, in the East Pacific, this is just the east-west, so this is the east side of the basin, this is the west side of the basin. Um, depth going down. This is dissolved iron in both. I left the scales exactly the same. This is the excess strongest iron binding ligands. So these are the ligand concentrations we measured in excess of dissolved iron. Nearly all of the iron, 99.99%, is bound by organic ligands, and that profile would represent, uh, would look very similar to dissolved iron. And then total ligand concentrations, this is the, includes not only the excess strong ligands, but also a weaker ligand class that we measure in these samples. And what you can see, first of all, in the iron, is you can see the influence of the continental margin, right? So uh, this point right here where these two legs cross is right off of Africa. Not surprising, you see some influence there, but also from, these are low oxygen waters where you have high productivity in the surface waters, and you remobilize iron at depth. This pronounced feature here, these are hydrothermal vents. So one of the big um, things we've seen from the Geotraces program is that there is an incredible amount of iron coming out of these hydrothermal vents, and it is not just local. So in the Atlantic, we kind of catch more of this local signal. In the Pacific, we're catching not just what's coming out of the East Pacific rise at this particular vent site, but also probably an advective signal from up the rise um, a little bit. But this is something like 4,000 kilometers, right? So this, this iron signal is propagating across the ocean basin, which is um, pretty exciting and is due to organic complexation. So one of the other things we see is this, um, this depletion of the excess stronger ligands in the eastern side of the basin in the Atlantic and throughout the Pacific. This appears to be an aging effect that we are seeing strong iron, iron binding ligands in excess in the Atlantic, younger waters of the Atlantic, and as those waters age we're seeing degradation of that ligand class. I don't know if that's true. I'm spending some time with various tracers and um, and models to try to get at that. And then again, in the weaker ligand class, this is what seems to really be important for propagating that plume. You can see that that ligand class is especially depleted in the plume waters here. And so we have lots more questions to ask from this data set than we have answers. Um, and th these are still unpublished, um, but that's kind of what I'm working on right now, at least. All right, so sources, sinks, and cycling of ligands. Where do these ligands come from? So one of the other things we do in my lab is we, we like to grow up bugs, and now we not just grow them up, we also kill them. Um, and we look at how ligand concentrations change over those cycles. And so as part of my postdoctoral work in Kathy's Barbeau's lab at Scripps, we did incubation experiments with diatom communities in the Southern Ocean here on the left, in the California current here on the right. And I know there's a lot here, but what you can see is over the course of the incubation experiment in the control bottles, which is this blue line here, and in here in the open circles, we see this production of strong iron binding ligands over time. As the phytoplankton, as the diatom communities start to grow, we see these big increases in strong iron binding ligands. Now, this surprises us because we think of strong iron binding ligands coming from primarily bacteria, who we know have the, the machinery to produce these kinds of very strong iron binding ligands. We call them siderophores. Um, so what we think might actually be happening, or what we've proposed, is that it's not the diatoms producing it. It's the bacteria that live on the surface of those diatoms, and that it's a, uh, a mutualistic interaction between the diatom and phytoplankton in those um, environments. And we leave for the Southern Ocean next week to go and test that hypothesis. Another possible source of iron binding ligands in the oceans could be viruses themselves. So Maya Breitbart here on the faculty and myself, we are co-supervising a student, Chelsea Bonet, and we just published a paper on what we call the ferrogen horse hypothesis, which is based on non-marine systems. So in the E. coli system, in the terrestrial environment, we know that the, the phage, the viruses that infect those bacteria, have iron atoms in their tails. These viruses infect E. coli through the iron siderophore uptake systems of those bacteria, called Ton B dependent receptors. Um, so our hypothesis is that it's actually iron acting as a Trojan horse into this iron uptake system. Bacteria cannot select against these iron uptake systems because they absolutely need that iron to survive, and that leaves them vulnerable to infection. Um, in the, once the phage infects the bacteria, it multiplies ridiculously and creates new phage progeny. Um, and so we also are hypothesizing that that's where the iron in the tails comes from. As the, these viruses replicate themselves inside the cell, they use the intracellular components of those bacteria to get the iron that they need to build these tails, and then they go out and destroy the world. So if this is true, this is, um, if this is true in the marine environment, it does have pretty profound implications on our understanding of the iron biogeochemical cycle and the role of viruses. And so we're very excited about this. We've got a proposal going in, um, hopefully very soon, to get money to support these efforts. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so, 
when you look at different um, types of ligands, this is a, from a review paper that I wrote um, in 2012, and then Chelsea's paper, we added viruses in here cheekily. Um, and this is looking at kind of this size spectrum. It's important to consider, you know, we look at size fractions with filters. That's how we define them. Um, but the reality is that it's a continuum. And we know that there are, for example, inorganic species of iron, they're extremely low abundance. We think that, for example, the iron 3 plus ion concentration in a liter of sig seawater is roughly Avogadro's number, right? 10 to the minus 23. So it's very, very low abundance, but it is there. Then we have these organic complexes, some of which we don't know. We think some are in viruses. We think some are in humic type substances, degradation products from cells. Um, and those would be weaker ligands, as well as the discrete siderophores that we know are out there. So lastly, how do these ligands and their cycles influence the biogeochemical cycle of metals? Um, this is something that kind of started us down this path. And I think, you know, um, so I just wrote a, an article for the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Program's newsletter. And I realize this is also very complicated for you. But over here is kind of looking at, at cycles on the interfaces and cycles in internal cycling. And it's all very complicated. But the point is, is that there is an iron dissolved in the ocean in my very biased personal opinion, without organic ligands. And so it is really important to consider that every time you have an iron source, it is probably coming in already complexed at, to an organic ligand by function. Otherwise, it would have been lost to the sediments before it got there. Um, some of the exceptions are hydrothermal vents, where we know we have these inorganic iron sources coming out. Very cool work coming out of Brandy Toner's lab as part of our geotraces study in the East Pacific Rise, is that the bacteria that are associated, so at hydrothermal vents, you get chemosynthesis, which is a, another type of autotrophy. It creates a dissolved organic carbon plume. Bacteria then grow on that dissolved organic carbon plume. And what they find is that they produce siderophores that bind that iron and actually solubilize some of that iron coming out of the vent and allow it to propagate outside of the plume itself, which is very exciting and consistent with our speciation data from the plumes. Um, we also know we get inorganic iron coming in from dust, but there's also some evidence that even on the surface of dust particles, little persistent bacteria on there are producing siderophores on the surface of the dust and solubilizing some of that iron as well. So, you know, the more we look into this, the more kind of exciting it gets. One of the really interesting things that's come out of some of the work we've done looking at the role of ligands themselves, kind of um, not just iron bound to ligands, is that in modeling studies, if you, if you do a global ocean, bio, a global biogeochemical model of iron in the oceans, and you, uh, if anybody knows modelers, they do these things called sensitivity studies, which are like turning little knobs, right? They like turn a knob and see what happens, see how close they get to, the, to representing the actual concentration distributions that we measure out there. And one of the things that they have found is that if you double the ligand concentration in those models, you change the iron concentration more than if you double the dust deposition to the surface ocean. So ligands have a more pronounced influence on iron chemistry in the oceans than iron inputs themselves. And that is because those iron inputs cannot stick in the surface ocean or in the water column at all, really, without organic complexation. So I'm not, as I promised, not just interested in iron. I swear we do. <laughs> we just get a lot more funding for iron. Um, but for copper, you know, not only can we measure the ambient um, organic complexation of copper and calculate how much free copper is there and say something about whether or not a system is toxic for copper, um, which can be very useful in inshore waters where copper concentrations exceed water quality guidelines, um, but we can also predict copper toxicity from the titrations that we do in the lab. And so what I'm showing here, and this is preliminary data we haven't published yet, um, but is based on work I did in my thesis in San Francisco Bay, is that as you increase the copper concentrations, you, if there was no organic complexation, you would kind of expect that the log-free copper would just shoot straight up through the roof, right? But depending on the ligand pool in that sample, you get this, this curve, this bend. And I put this red box here because at 10 to the minus 11 free copper, all the bugs are dying, even the diatoms. Um, and what's really interesting is that in the same estuary, in two very different sites, um, this one here is in um, Grizzly Bay, which is a system that is influenced by a lot of um, marshlands there, natural marshlands that have been preserved, versus this site here, which is right under the Golden Gate Bridge, you reach toxic free copper concentrations at much lower concentrations of total dissolved copper under the Golden Gate Bridge than you do out in this fight more than an order of magnitude um, than you do up in Grizzly Bay, even though the dissolved copper in this system is an order of magnitude higher than the total dissolved copper in this system. And so 
Copper toxicity is not a function of the concentration of copper. It's a function of the speciation of copper. And the presence of organic ligands, particularly ligands that seem to be coming from these natural marshlands, are incredibly important towards buffering elevated copper concentrations. And so um, one of the parts that came out of my thesis was some work funded by the EPA to establish site-specific water quality guidelines for copper. And that's something that I would like to work on here in the local waters, if I can manage to convince Sea Grant to fund um, the work. We'll see about that. All right, so I'm going to end. Um, these are the questions in my lab, and I'll take any questions that you have for me.